Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for coming. And I would just like to thank again the organisers of this inspiring event. I know there's only one more speaker after me, but the ladies who have gone uh, before me have been absolutely inspiring. And I do genuinely feel, feel humbled to be on the same stage as them. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about my space in between, which is a grey area. Um, there are actually three other inhabitants in my grey area. Uh, people that I see and live with every day. My daughter Liz, my son Ray and my husband John in the family business. So whenever I'm talking about the grey area and me, we're all in it together. And whenever one's happy, we're all happy. When one's sad or cross, we're all sad. So um, bear in mind that there's four of us in this story. So I ended up in the grey area around June 2008. We had been having, we'd had a very successful tree and shrub nursery uh, over the previous 22 years and we began to worry about the decline in the construction industry where we had been very involved with uh, supply of trees and shrubs. So we began to worry that perhaps uh, we were entering an era of change and uncertainty and volatility. Um, no one came to us and said, look, this is what's going to happen. I just had this inherent worry that perhaps that what was happening. Uh, we were in this area for a year, 18 months. We listened continually to uh, forecasts, economic forecasts, and we began to really think something has happened here, something has changed. What went on in the previous 20 to 25 years in business and in life may not be how the future is going to proceed. Uh, maybe change, volatility, uncertainty, vulnerability, we're all here to stay. Maybe we were entering an era of dwindling natural and financial resources. And if this was the case, um, what were we going to do? People were waiting, people were wondering. And um, I decided, and I think we all decided, that yes, perhaps life has changed, and uh, let's, let's embrace it, and let's see what happens. Say, let's say change is here to stay. So we embarked down the road of accepting change and deciding, yes, we are where we are. Uh, we've come a long way, but let's see where we're going, because I don't think anyone at that time, or perhaps even today, which is four to five years later, knows where all of this is going. So we spoke to friends and business associates. There was a lot of fear. People were genuinely worried, because whenever you've been going down one track fairly easily, lots of hard work, but the road wasn't terribly bumpy. Whenever you come to an area of sudden change, and it was fairly sudden, whenever you come to that stage, it does worry you. And we were almost divided into two camps. There was the people who were fully optimistic, next spring, next autumn, bear in mind 18 months had passed of autumns and springs, and nothing was happening, but they were still very optimistic. Uh, I was in the camp of, this is dreadful, this is absolutely terrible, I just don't know what we're going to do. Then I was seen as being pessimistic. I, I didn't want to come across as pessimistic, because I'm not pessimistic, but I did want to say to the optimists, look, I don't think it's going to get better, you know, without sounding pessimistic. Um, <laughs> so I was trying to be optimistic to the optimists, and um, so they were fearful but optimistic. I was optimistic and perhaps less fearful. And uh, I decided that we would have to move forward with our best possible thoughts, armed with whatever resilience we could gather together, the four of us, uh, and, and take, take whatever we had forward. We didn't know what we had, where we were going, but we just knew that change was out there. So uh, I had to make small changes uh, whenever someone would have said to me, how are you? Instead of saying, not bad, I would say, feeling great, even if, it, even if I wasn't. But I didn't want to say not and bad being negative words. And if someone would say, can you help me? I would say, yes, certainly. Previously, I'd have said, no problem. And again, I felt no and problem um, 
we're just, I, just, I had to just get away from that mindset. So we uh, decided that we would have to look for our strengths, and our strengths were um, uh, horticulture and our belief in sustainable businesses. Because over the past period of time, people have always thought about where has this coffee come from, where has this been transported from, what's it been sprayed with, what's it been dyed with, but nobody ever really, people were trying to ask, but uh, suddenly something was changing, which the change was happening, suddenly it was saying that coffee that was gathered, those villagers who climbed to the utmost part of that tree to get the sweetest uh, beans, how much were they paid for that coffee? Um, the villagers who grew those little plants that are shipped halfway around the world, what did they earn? What is the carbon footprint of this product? What is the water footprint of this product? Suddenly these questions, which needed to be asked for so long, were being asked and people were listening. And I think even stretch of the imagination, governments were listening. Uh, we had always had an interest in water and um, even the fact that scientists realized that Today, by 2030, we may only have 40% of the water that is available that we need. So by 2030, whenever children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, whoever, you know, that's a generation who will be looking for water. And people would often say to me, oh yes, water's going to be the new oil. And I have to say to them, well actually I totally disagree that water's going to be the new oil because if and when, as we will, run out of oil, when we run out of oil, we'll use something else to heat and run vehicles and use for energy. There's always alternatives to oil. When we run out of water, I don't know what we're going to do, because man has not yet learned to invent water. So um, we decided that we would look into... I'd read an article about NASA, who had sent their astronauts into space, given them a few seeds, tiny, tiny amount of water, they would have sunlight, and they were told, go and grow food, which was absolutely amazing. And if you look at this shot, you know, even today, you can go to a blog, and the astronauts are in space, and the roots and the plant is floating about with zero gravity uh, growing, with uh, using a tiny, tiny amount of water. So uh, that's where aeroponics would have been uh, founded, up in some space station somewhere high above, and aeroponics today does use 70 to 80 percent less water, uh, which is a fantastic uh, source of growth for the future. We decided within our nursery, we have always grown wheatgrass in the nursery. Uh, we've been growing wheatgrass for 20 years. I have been consuming wheatgrass for 20 years, growing it in seed trays. I consume wheatgrass because of two things, it increases my energy levels while simultaneously decreasing the wrinkles on my face. <laughs> I shouldn't really say that, but it does, it does. So we, I mean, friends and family would always be taking wheat, we'd always be saying, take a shot of this, and they'd say, oh please, no, but anyway, they took the wheatgrass. So we decided we would have a go, if NASA could do it, well, Northern Ireland may as well give it a shot. <laughs> So um, we, we got our wheatgrass, we built a pod, and we had our wheatgrass seeds, we sprayed them out. Day three, we were examining the shoots, we were looking underneath, we were as interested in the roots as we were in the top growth, thinking of the astronauts and their roots. In 25 years, we had never been interested in the roots of our wheatgrass, ever. And suddenly, we wanted to see the roots. So by day three, there was lots of little sprouts, and we thought, yes, this is going to work. So you can imagine that by day nine, uh, whenever we saw the luscious, green, sturdy growth. Much more sturdy than conventional wheatgrass because it has much more water. This wheatgrass only has had 20% of the water that are conventional, so it's much more sturdy. If it was a lettuce, it wouldn't wilt as quickly as a conventional lettuce. Uh, the roots looked fantastic. They looked absolutely good enough to eat. And, and then we thought, well, could you eat them? And, I, and we didn't know whether you could eat them or not. You eat the carrot roots and you eat the potato roots. Um, you know. So we sent them away to the lab with our own um, conventionally grown wheatgrass and the results came back and it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, we discovered that 
uh, there are amino acids in the roots that are not found in the top growth. There are amino acids in the top growth, but there's some amino acids in the roots that are not in the top growth, and um, a very powerful antioxidant. So, I mean, we were really, really excited about being able to produce wheat grass using 80% less water. So we have been uh, working in partnership with a firm in Malaysia who are the world's only aeroponic wheat grass producers who do use 80% less water. And we are um, working on a product, hoping that everyone will be able to try wheat grass uh, with, with the roots. So we're very excited about that. The um, opportunities for aeroponics is absolutely unbelievable. This is in Peru where they are growing potatoes aeroponically, uh, with no soil. Uh, and I often think of the farmers in Ireland with their wooden wheelbarrows and laid down with seaweed for fertilizer for the potatoes. If those farmers could see these photographs, there is five times, up to five times the yield without the soil and, and fertilizer. The, and especially for seed potatoes and for third world countries to be able to produce seed potatoes in this quantity will be absolutely fantastic. So aeroponics, I think in the next 10 to 15 years, I think it'll be a very common, uh, I mean people did think we had lost the plot, I mean they really did. <laughs> they would be used with our funny ideas, you know, but that's, they did think we'd gone a step too far with this. So. Um, they, uh, we just think we're so excited that perhaps third world countries can benefit with a shipping container, a solar panel, burning a grow light inside, and they can use the tiny, tiny amount of water available, and that would irrigate the roots. So the opportunities are, are endless. So at the end of our grey area, which is, th that's a five year story condensed into eight or nine minutes. At the end of our grey area, which we're still in, I don't think we've left it, I think there's lots of people still in a grey area. Um, what we have gained from this grey area is uh, two things. Firstly, the sheer amount of coincidences that have taken place during this time. People that we've never met, people who ring us and say, did you hear about this and we go to that, or you see an article in the newspaper, or someone pops into your life, has been staggering over the past five years. And lots of people who know would say that there are no such thing, of, as, thing as coincidences, that it's all mapped out and that's the way it's meant to be. And the, the second and probably most overriding thing that we've noticed, and I know I can speak on behalf of John, Ray and Liz, is the sheer innate decency and goodwill and kindness of people that we have encountered while we've been in this gray area. Um, it, it has been astounding. So that just leaves me to f finish off and say that my time in the grey area has been stressful, eventful, fearful, energising, and I would thoroughly recommend it. <laughs> <laughs>